is if test tty uh, equals not a tty cd to dollar tempter and then uh, phi suppose the then should be in there too and that'll put NQS jobs into the temporary directory and you don't have to put it in the job itself then question yeah and these are the other way thank you so uh, that's all you'd need to do in future releases. The cleanup and the creation of the directory are all automatic. But this is the way we did it before 5.0. And the other way is the lower example is simply to bury it in the job itself and put it in the front of the job. Now in this job we have some NQS directives. This is the old way of doing it and I'm going to come back to NQS later. Talk about these directives. And it's the same basic job we had before fetch in our data, compile our source, link it together, execute it, and then a move. A move is also, instead of copying the stuff, we could have moved it. It will result in a copy. It will result in the same thing because it's across file systems. However, the old version is gone, whereas the copy, you've got both versions, depending upon what you want to do. So we could move. Uh, out to dollar home slash project slash out and that would relate to a save and this would relate to the access or something like this well not really that but a full path name being specified just in here if we if we put a full path name in here. Would relate to an access. Since that's creating the output, you you don't access an output. That's why I had to change my So that's what you deal with accesses and saves. And it really depends upon whether it's going to be implemented in NQS or interactive. Now my lower example just buried it explicitly in the program. One other thing I might point out that I used to do, this dollar dollar sign gives it a unique number. So that's another way I could get an addition concept. Rather than addition concept, I could say process number that created the file. So down here, Rather than doing this move, when I create the file, I can put the parent process number on the end of the file name. And that isn't an addition number, but it's a unique number associated to the job run, which may, is even better in some people's mind, maybe, because they can identify which job run it was that that output came from, tie it up with the system accounting again. And then removal at the end of the job. Uh, with prior releases, we had to remove everything when we were done. Up here with the uh, dot profile method, we simply did a trap to remove our temporary directory and all files in it. So implicitly or explicitly within the job. Now with 5.0, NQS does it for you. You don't have to specify anything. And you don't have to use a trap to do it either. It'll do it for you to clean it up when you're done, when the job terminates. One other thing I might mention here is I used to teach hyphen EO on NQS jobs. I no longer recommend that. Let me explain why. How many people have looked through dollar outs before and, you know, lines and lines and lines and numbers of dollar out? If you combine these two, standard error isn't going to be at the end of dollar out, it's going to be intermixed in it whenever they get written to buffers. So you're going to find standard error information buried in standard out information, making it very hard to find sometimes. 
and very easy to miss. So by keeping them separate, you can go to just the error file and scan that a lot quicker. Who wants to look at output data? So it's not like COS where it depends it to the end. It will intermix it pretty much as, it be, as it's occurring from job step to job step. So for debugging purposes, it's better to keep them separated. I used to combine them because that's what COS did. But because they're interleaved, it made it hard to debug. You'd find uh, operand range error, and then you'd find your data. And that didn't make sense. You'd expect the operand range error to be at the end of your output, that sort of thing. RM is the same thing as delete and release. In this example, if we wanted to release something, that would be removing uh, out, for example. A release would be remove out. What would a delete be? A delete would be to remove the entire, specify the full path name, remove full path name being a delete, and a release being just remove your temporary file name. And again, this all is centered around that dollar tempter concept. Oh, goody. I did not clean my transparency off, so we'll just start with what I have. Audit comparing it to LS in Unicos. Uh, you can draw any arrows you want on your page. You will find all this information available in Unicos. And let's just start up here. The first thing I have is my ownership. And ownership relates down, I've got my arrows drawn wrong, really. There's this column right here, DAW. I am the ownership on Unicos of all those files right there. I'm also in the marketing group, which in the way we run COS here, a bunch of people use the same ownerships. So that could relate to the group as well. That, that's why that one, I think, was drawn there. In this case, marketing. Uh, PDN. PDN is the file name, far right. That's what LS is going to give you by default, is the file name. If you had an ID specified, we'll get to that. MIGR in this case, I relate that to the directory name, which is up here in the left corner of the LS. The edition number, uh, we talked about that. Anything with an old in front of it is an older edition. That's the way you look at it. Created time, the time a file is created is specified with an FCK command. That will tell you more information about the file than LS will. And we have created, modified, and last accessed. Only modification date shows up in the LS command. So FCK can tell you more information about it. So created time, last access time, and last modified time are all available with FCK. And then the modification date is available right next to the file name. Everyone with me? We're going through data set attributes. <laughs> Last dumped. In Unicos, they do not keep a dump date to each file. What they do is when they do a system dump, they keep a system dump date. And then dump and restore compares the modification date to the system dump date. And it says if the modification date is newer than the system dump date, this file is a candidate for migration. Or candidate for dumping, I mean. So the last dump date is really just a system dump date compared to the modification date of the file. There's no dump date per file kept. The device it's on, in this case the DD49 that it's on and the IOP number is available in uh, FCK, a couple other places you're going to find it too. Uh, Procstat can tell you that information too. In this case, it's just saying that it's an inode resident file and you'd have to find out where the inode is to figure out where it is. Any file that's less than a block can be put right in the inode. Anything less than 512 words. So it doesn't really specify the, the device that it's on. Another way that you can get the device though is with the df command. The df command will specify where that file system sits on the disk drives. So if you know what file system you're in, the DF command can show you the physical device that file system sits on. What do you mean to say it's 
Inodes are pointers, but they're sitting out on disk drives. Just like the data set catalog information, the inode is how you find it. And when you find a data set, he goes through the inode list for that directory to get to the file. Finds the inode, and then he knows where the file is. In that same structure, right after the structure of the inode, there's space left over. And for small files, you know, you've got a lot of one-liners and stuff like that that don't take up, you know, a lot of space. So let's save a block. So if there's space, they're going to throw it in there. Now, it's not exactly 512 words, because minus, minus the size of the inode, pretty much. And I don't know what that size is specifically. But that saves you time. Then your file is right there. You don't have to go any further to get it. So it will bury it right in the inode in the space left over. So you're saying that with the, uh, these two utilities, LS and FCK, that uh, you get the, basically the same information? Sure. Right. Yeah. OK, but this latter utility is not the uh, Unix? Sure. FCK is a Unix tool. Unix. Yeah, as far as I know. You fit a man on it, didn't show up. Well, it, it was on the pyramid? Yeah. OK. I'll, I'll check on that. I always thought it was a Unix utility, but uh, pyramid Unix isn't the same. I, I don't know. I'll check. Okay. I thought it was. But uh, on the uh, 218, you should definitely get a man page for it, for FCK. And this is useful to find out how spread out your file is, too. If you've got a hog of an application doing heavy I.O., this will tell you if that thing's fragmented and split up across uh, different devices and stuff tell you about striping information, stuff like that, too. So it is, in a way, a performance tool, useful performance tool as well for tuning. And it tells you the inode number and a variety of other statistics about it. Uh, the next one we have is size. In COS, that's words. In Unicos, it's bytes. Unix works in a byte environment. You're just going to see bytes instead of words. So numbers look bigger. I might also point out that, from what I've seen, Small applications have on the order of 10% larger binary size. In the test cases that we see here in training, you know, where we've got 30 or 40 lines of code, if it's 100,000 lines of code, I've seen on the order of 2% larger. I've never actually seen a binary smaller on Unicos than on COS. But it depends upon the number of lines in terms of what the ratio is of how much bigger it is on Unicos. And this has to do with libraries more than anything and the way the libraries are organized. Uh, the next one is retention period. There is some things in the archiving system that's going to, I wouldn't call it retention period, but there's, there's a dot keep file and a few things like that to keep files around. But nothing that you can really map to the retention period as such. So I've got it just crossed off there. Access tracking. Number of accesses and who's accessing it. The security log daemon can track that. There's an S log daemon and reduces the utility that can read that information. Now, this is only for administrators, preferably security administrators. But you can act, track access of data sets to find out who's using them, how often they're being used. And there is some performance payoff or penalty there because you're uh, doing formatted I.O. of path names. And uh, keeping this log can be costly. Uh, the next one we have is the access mode, the public access mode. I relate this to permissions. In here, we have read, write, and execute permission for user, group, and other. And that's the closest thing we can relate it to. So read, write, and execute. In, in COS, you also have maintenance permission. And in COS, you can. Uh, uh, get different discretionary control with passwords and allowing passwords to be specified with a read-write maintenance permission. Question? You said that there's also other access lists. Access control is part of the security feature, right? Does that have information as to like what kind of access a particular user yeah. is given access to have? Yes. So in your access control list, you can tell him whether he has read-write or execute permission and what group he's in. Yeah. Yeah, right, right in here, right. Yeah. 
So, yeah, but you can do an SPACL and add a user to a particular access control list, and it's SP set to associate that access control list to a file. And then you've got it secure. Turn Chimode off on everything and just add them to the access control list. The only secure system is one that's administrated properly. So, <clears throat> anything else? Uh, the next one we have, other than pap public access mode relating to permissions, really deals with the whether the device is online or archived, things like that. I might point out that in Unicos 5.0, there will be an M appearing in this first column if the thing is offline. And I don't really have any relation to this, whether it's a, a private device and that sort of thing. Now the next page, with, it shows a DF command. And if you know where your file is in the file system, the DF command can tell you where it is on the, on the device. And will give you the, the starting cylinder number and that sort of information. So this one is just a DF command showing all the different partitions that we have and where they are on the, on the devices, that disk drives that you have out there. And also showing how much of the space is free. DF is one you'll use a lot when your application doesn't seem to be working right or bombs out or aborts. It will not tell you that the file system is full. It will simply say things like can't make a directory or things like that. Hopefully the administrator has already mailed you a message saying that your file system area is filling up and action is going to have to be taken. So that's a DF command. The next example deals with uh, Fortran units. And I'd like to, first of all, jump to a, a page that I have and talk about different ways of doing a science. And you don't have, have this in your workbook, so you may want to take notes. This is something that came up last time I went through this class. First of all, you can assign within the application, internal to the application. If you get a, a write on a Fortran unit, you're going to get a fort.xx number. You don't have to create the thing or anything like that. So any applications that open a Fortran unit, it's going to create a file with an inode with the name fort.xx. Also, you can get an alias on the open. Instead of a Fortran unit number, you can get the alias. Secondly is with the link command. The link command gives you an alias and a second inode at the command level. Now this is the way we used to teach before we had the assign command on how to do assigning a file, for example, data to Fortran unit 11 or something like that. With Unicos 3.0 and up, we have a new command called assign. This is not Unix, this is Cray. The assign command creates an IO attributes file. And we're going to get into this in a second. And in that attributes file, it gives information about the alias, the Fortran unit number that it is, and data set structure, buffer sizes, all those sorts of things on the assign command. So assign creates this attributes file. The IO libraries then reference it to determine how to handle the IO on the data set. Now there are two ways of specifying this IO attributes file. One is at a global level and one is at the command step level. The example you have in your workbook is the second one, the command step level. You're going to see it documented both ways. And I'll explain the difference coming up. The final method is 5 and 6. Fortran units 5 and 6 are pre-connected. You do not have to assign them. They are connected to standard in and standard out. And all you do is use the IO redirection signs like we did up here for Fortran units 5 and 6. Now the JCL converter cannot deal with this. It will not recognize 5 and 6 uniquely. And it will try to do an assign on them. And that's garbage. You cannot assign Fortran units 5 and 6. Now presently this does not include implicit foreign data set conversion like you have in COS. The last I talked to the developer, that command name was ASG. And in 6.0, the two products may merge into one. Well, there's still discussion going on in terms of how they're going to handle the IO attributes versus the foreign data set attributes of a file. 
but ASG is what it's tentatively called right now. And the only thing, well, I'll get to that in a second. So those are the four ways of actually dealing with uh, assigning Fortran units particular attributes, such as names and uh, I.O. specific stuff. Now your example, I first of all have a comment here that with Unico future Unicos is the ampersand dollar sign is still valid, but the documentation is all going to show Q sub to say that it's an NQS directive. So all your future examples should say Q sub instead of at dollar sign. And that's just for standards. It will accept the other one. It's just uh, for, for cleaner readable code or something. Hyphen R jar job. This is the same thing as the job name on COS. This is what it will appear as in the Q structures. So when you do a Q stat hyphen A, it will appear there as the job name. An interesting thing about this is it took them a long time to admit to the concept of a job in Unix. They said, ah, no such thing as a job. It's all processes. This used to be a hyphen J option, and somebody made them change it to a hyphen R option for request name so that we didn't inherit COS idiosyncrasies. However, now in 5.0, they have job termination records, and they do call it a job now, and job numbers that are carried in the accounting database. So they're, they're slowly coming to a, a COS way of thinking in some of this area. Hyphen EO, I mentioned, combined standard error and standard out. We don't want that anymore. It makes it difficult to debug. It was done just to make it look like a COS job would. I also have some comments over here on the side. Uh, NQS does look for generic resource usage information. So if you have star SSD or star tape, star uh, cart, those types of things on your COS job cart, this would relate to a hyphen LQ for SDS to get to the SSD and a hyphen LU for tape and declare the number of tape drives or declare the amount of SSD space you want. And then NQS will use that information to schedule the job and won't let the job run unless there's available resources. Once the job's running, you then have to schedule again with an RSV command and reserve uh, tape drives, for example. Uh, then I have a set hyphen X or a set hyphen V shown in here and a JA command. The JA command starts job accounting. This is something different from COS. You have to, by default, you won't get job accounting because there's overhead involved. So what it says is this first JA tells the system that when you write a system accounting file, write one to the user's working directory as well and use a name called J account. And then at the end of the job, he can read that. And I don't even read that in this job example. So I could go back in and take a look at the charges type report that's generated by this job run. Now I have a here document saying data is going to be 15. I then, in your example, have an environment file env equals ex1. Now this is the job step example for doing an assign. What we're saying is that the variable file env on this job step is going to be pointing to ex1. And ex1 is what's going to contain the actual I.O. attributes. You could cat that file and it would be cryptic, but it would tell you the Fortran units that you're assigned to and all the information about them. Though each field is not labeled, you have to know what each field means. So ex1 or file env points to ex1 and in ex1 is this I.O. attributes information. The assign command then simply does an assign hyphen A, says the alias of this thing, in this case is going to be data, is Fortran unit 10. So to Fortran unit 10, we're going to rename this thing data. And that would then do the same thing as the link. We'd know to access this data file up here that was just created with the here document. Now I have a second example here is that if you want to get to the SSD, you put an SDS there instead of uh, the file name. And that'll put that Fortran unit off on the SSD. Also, there's a hyphen S for structures, and you can specify it as a COS data set. You can change buffer sizes. There are a variety of I.O. attributes that you can modify with the assign command. I'll also point out that this is the source spot for compatibility between the X and the 2. They predict somewhere around 7.0 or 8.0 that the two assigned syntaxes will merge into one. 
but if you're porting between machines, uh, XMP, YMP, or Cray 2, Cray 3 architectures, this line's going to be different syntactically. Now, that's a, that's a step, job step level, and when we execute the application down here, we say, tell the I.O. libraries that file ENV is EX1, and then execute the application. The advantage of doing it on a job step level is that you can have different attribute files. So you could run it once with SDS configuration, run it a second time with a buffer size change. It allows you to have different assign attributes for different job runs. That's the only advantage of it. The other way that it's documented, I mentioned, is at the global level. And somewhere up in here, after the set, for example, we would say file env equals ex1 and then export file env. And then everybody knows that file env is ex1. And then down here when we execute it, we don't even need that line. a.out will know that file env is ex1. It's global to him. He knows what it is. So you're going to see it documented both ways. Uh, the default, if you don't specify this thing, is dot assign. And, and examples, we use dot assign as a common file rather than ex1. EX1 was kind of example one that just kind of creeped its way into the documentation. This little note right here is just kind of showing you what the file structure looks like of EX1. And it would have different fields for buffer sizes and a bunch of different things. And you can't even find that documented anymore. You don't need to go into it anyways. And then the name of the Fortran unit. My second comment here is that the ASG command will work in conjunction with this for foreign data set conversion. And uh, we can talk about that later. Next example is security. This is how it worked. I did an LS hyphen E gave me my security access control list information we were talking about whether it's got an access control list and also security level for it. I then went into my dot profile and showed that I have a UMass command to set up default permissions so that only user gets permissions read, write, and execute. Everyone else is shut off by default. The next uh, prompt, you should probably for 5.0 put an SP in front of that. SPACL is the 5.0 name to maintain this access control list. And the name of my access control list was dot list. So in dot list is my user database of who can get to the file uh, that I assign this access control list to. And I go, user's name is BEK, group is marketing, permission of access is read and execute only, no write permission. I then quit SPHCL. SPGET tells me what my permissions and security levels are. In Mendota Heights, we run without security, and they're all zero. But on site, that would be more meaningful for a site that's running security. SPSET then sets this access control list, dot list to a directory called tool 3.0. Now note on the top LS, the tool 3.0 uh, does not have an A after it. Down here, it does. So that says that it now has an access control list associated to it. I did a chmode on everything in this directory so the group and others get taken off on read, write, and execute permission. And I did a wild character here. Uh, there's an extra R in there that shouldn't be in there. So if chmodes were not modified and they have permission at the chmode level, it'll never go to the access control list. If permissions are turned off with Chmode, then he checks the access control list. If he's in there, he gets access. If he's not, he's uh, denied access. And it doesn't really give you an explanation. It says, can't access file. It doesn't tell you why. So that's the security, and that's all that a user really needs to know about is SPACL and SPGET, SPSET. And uh, there's some newer things that for changing compartments once you've actually got compartments, configurations, and people working in a variety of uh, security levels and compartments. I'm going to wind down here. Foreign data set support is in 5.0. Prior to 5.0, the library calls were there, but nothing was implied. It was all explicit foreign data set conversion. With Unicode's 5.0, it's tentatively called an ASG command. They're talking in future releases about wrapping assign and ASG together. 
uh, don't know the status of that. Support in 5.0 is the top four. CDC did not make the 5.0 release. So anybody that's got a CDC machine has got to consider that. The way they're going to have to deal with that is explicitly do it in the application or wait for 6.0. It did not make code cutoff. And there is talk about COS being treated as a foreign data set because it is foreign to the Unix environment. So uh, I don't have a man page for ASG or anything like that. <coughs> PDS dump and PDS load and online tapes. I've got some tape job examples here. Uh, basically, I uh, specify the number of tape drives I want. I think it's a, a V in your, let's see. Oh, it's a lowercase, that's what it is. It should be an uppercase U, not a lowercase U. And I'm saying number of tape drives, and I never figured out what U meant for tape drives, but that's what you get. Capital U says number of tape drives. Is it minus capital U? Uh, L, capital U. Lowercase l, capital U. And then one tape drive required. You then, once the job gets initiated by NQS, reserve the tape unit, RSV tape 1. And that would be the generic resource name. It could be cart for cartridge as well. TPMNT is the tape mount command. This relates to access with device type equaling tape. So half of access deals with the uh, uh, Date file system access. Another half of it deals with tape access, and the third part deals with uh, foreign data set conversion. So foreign data set conversion is going to be handled with ASG, and the tape portion handled with TPMNT. And everything on the access statement translates to a TPMNT option. Hyphen L for no label, hyphen V for volume name, hyphen P is where he's going to do the I.O. through. And there's a lowercase p and an uppercase p. The difference between them is that one will abort if the file exists. Another one will overwrite the file if it exists. And I, off the top of my head, can never remember which one is which. So look them up. One will say abort. One will say overwrite between lowercase p and uppercase p. And then hyphen g says the generic resource. I should probably have a hyphen ring on this as well. Now, if this is an NQS job, it's going to go off to some temporary directory and dump nothing. So I have to put in a CD in here to change to some directory where I'm actually going to dump what it is I'm going to dump. Or I could do this interactively. The next statement really relates to PDS dump. Find dot print depth. And I should have name in there as well. Or no, I don't need name. That's right. Uh, this is going to dump everything from my present working directory and all directories underneath. That's going to supply a list of file names that goes to CPIO. CPIO hyphen C for portability, O for the uh, output option, and V for verbose mode to tell me what he writes. And all that's going to go off to this temp to tape dev, which is what TPMNT said the I.O. is going to occur through. So that's my PDS dump. And then in RLS, you can release your tape units before your next job steps. And you could call RLS from within the application through iShell to release your tape resources too. But this can't be done with SSD, only tapes. Uh, the next one is just the counterpart for it. I also have the comment here if you use the expander chassis. EXLP is the expander printer. EXTD is the expander Kennedy tape drive or CalComp or, I mean, data general tape drive, whatever it is you have out there. And EXDK is the expander disk pack, an Ampex or a CDC 80 megabyte disk pack. And that's how you'd get to those. Another common way, though, would be to use TAR instead of CPIO. And TAR has some good examples for doing the same sort of thing. The next example shows tape being done from the Fortran units with the assign command. So we, we go through our reservation process. We reserve our tape drive. We've got our here document in this, in this program. Compile it, link it. We then say file env equals ex1, export file env. 
and then assign hyphen S, BMX says tape. And on the Cray 2, it's tape. This is one of the differences. So if you want to get to the tape drive on the XMP, it's BMX, and on the Cray 2, it's called tape. A syntax difference that is, I think, idiotic because it's such a simple thing to deal with. Two programmers that didn't talk close enough and chose different option names. So that's saying Fortran Unit 20 is going to be on tape. We then mount the tape uh, itself, no label. Volume is SCR. The density is 6250. Ring is in. Uh, blocking factor, the file that is going doing the I.O. through, and then the name of the generic resource. And then we invoke our application. He's going to have some sort of input being directed into it. And then Fortran Unit 20 will be written on initiating the tape I.O. And then we can release the tape drive. Hyphen A says all tape drives are all resources. TP stat then just shows you what's going on with your tape drives, the user ID, the job ID, the generic resource name, uh, what's going on with it. Ring is in, uh, the automatic volume recovery serial number, some other things. Some of these are 5.0 features, and I haven't looked at them in the 5.0 man pages yet. Also have TPRST for uh, giving us our status, basically, our reservation status and how many have reserved, used, and available in our devices. These are more the operator side of it. The last thing we have to talk about is NQS, and then we're going to be done for the day. We've already gone through most of this, so it, it should be review at this point. The top is an example of a coast job that does job account, CFT, load, go. And its data is, or its uh, Fortran is in dollar in. In Unicos, first of all, we have a USCP validation card. Login uses this to create the login. So that user equals whoever you are, password is whatever your password is on the system. Then we have our NQS directives for request name, combined standard error and standard out, time limit. It has to be a capital T for a job time limit. The lowercase t is a process time limit. Start job accounting. Set my flag, and again, I'd switch that to a V now instead of an X for better debugging capability. Create my here document. Put daggers around EOFA so that you get a performance improvement. Compile, load, and execute. This is what then would be done for charges. JA will generate your, the last thing that you get in dollar log in COS, the charges report, and tell you total job statistics and stuff. So those two will generate the same comparable thing, except that uh, yeah, listings are turned off up here and turned off by default down here. Now I took that job. I do a Q stat, and it will tell me what my Q structure is like. So I can see what my Q structure is like. And that's all that we have on this page. Note that there is something going to uh, Cray 2 and 218 from 228. So I could do a Q sub to B Cray 2 or BSN 218, and it would go off to a different machine through the network. Uh, I don't have the next page. Don't have a transparency for it. But page 4-43, I then show my QSub command. QSub is going to submit it to NQS. While it's running or whatever, I can do a QSTAT hyphen F on it to get like a JSTAT statistics. Tell me why it's running or why it's queued. That's one of the new things now in 4.0 and 5.0 is that you can get reason for it being queued. Not enough tape, not enough SSD this sort of thing. And that's documented in the QSTAT man page. So 444 then is what I got out of this job. The plus signs are lines that were echoed by the hyphen X command. Note that cat doesn't have anything after it. It doesn't have the IO redirection. I then get my uh, a.out data here. One of the things that bothers people is that standard error comes in before standard out. It is the opposite in COS. And then my charges report is all the stuff on the bottom. Uh, 
Each command name, time it started at, elapsed time, user time, system time, IO wait time. Now this IO wait time is not necessarily the same as in COS. And in fact, will change from job run to job run. When you tune an application using this statistic, you want to do it in a dedicated mode because buffer contention, system buffer contention is going to influence that number. More users you have, the more the IO wait time. Uh, some memory integrals and stuff like that, tr transfers, logical and physical IOs, exit status, system billing units. If you were multitasking, this section in here would show you pr processes that are being forked off and show you any ch child processes that are being spawned. And then our summary report. Now this isn't completely compatible with COS yet. This is the big hole. In COS it tells you about RDM statistics and about the uh, front end, uh, station transfers, tape mounts, daemon processes. Unicos keeps these statistics, but JA fixes did not make 5.0. So JA doesn't know about these other numbers that, that are being kept around about him. Uh, it's something that simply did not make 5.0 and is a 6.0 feature. So JA doesn't know how many sectors were transferred to front ends, doesn't know how many tapes were mounted, how many blocks were... Stop. We're short a couple of people, but I think we can get started anyways. For those that uh, missed it, uh, yesterday I did pass out some I.O. optimization stuff. I don't know if I put one on your desk. I got one here. Yeah, I've got a second one here. You will get it in the Fortran course as well. Uh, I'll get you another one. But here it is. Are we going now? I don't think the mic's on yet. Okay. One thing I thought I'd do before I start up on the migration topics is I've, I've mentioned before, uh, I said yesterday there are like five areas in which COS and Unicos have uh, definite differences or lack of uh, software features of some sort. And I thought I'd try to summarize what those were at this point. And first of all, we will not be supporting SCOL. If you do have SCOL code, my recommendation is that you deal with it on COS and generate the Fortran out of that and, and move the output of the SCOL to Unicos. We will definitely not be supporting file position across job steps. I mentioned what to do yesterday with an application like that where you're going to find it with small memory scope type environments, data centers that used to run it or may still run it. Uh, the thing to do for it was to wrap the job steps into one job step and have some sort of stager program that, that calls the appropriate subroutines or subprograms, whatever they are. You definitely will not have sense switches. pseudo sense switches, both at the JCL level, library level, that sort of thing. Uh, there is the, uh, what am I trying to think? Copy, skip, rewind. JCL, which really ties into this one. 
Now the way you're going to deal with those is typically, in almost all cases, they're working on dollar in. And you're simply going to have to uh, maintain your text or whatever it is in dollar in in a different method in Unicos. Uh, you can use here documents if you want to actually still include it in the text, but not necessarily the best way to do it. More likely, the way you're going to want to maintain your source is to split it apart into F split. The reason for that is CDBX, because CDBX expects each subroutine to have its own symbol table. Otherwise, it, it has too much to deal with. So CDBX, its scope is always subroutine to subroutine. So you're going to want to split it apart and maintain it that way. And manipulating text at that level, uh, and this, again, is on source or whatever it is in dollar in, there are a variety of other tools, like your stream editor said. In fact, there's a, uh, there's a copy routine where you do special functions to slide things, insert spaces and stuff like that. And said is what we recommend doing for that. And you'll also have things like uh, uh, head and tail and split. And then there's all kinds of other things like awk and stuff like that that are, are uh, pattern replacing tools and things like that. So you have to deal with dollar in on a case by case basis. If it's source and mods and stuff like that, it's easy to deal with. If it's text, for example, one application we saw simply looked at the first hundred records and last hundred records of a file, printed it to dollar out. And that we did with a head and a tail. Uh, it really depends upon what they're doing with it. Uh, let's see, what else is there? The memory JCL. With this libcos, there will be support for the memory library call, but nothing at the JCL level. And uh, those are the things that the user are, are going to be big flags for you at the user. And this one, everybody is going to flag on the different copies and skips. But you just have to deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis take a look at what they're doing in them. And hope they're not doing anything uh, unusual. <laughs> a lot of cases, it's typically source. Now, if it's data, we were getting into a case in my last conversion class where the person did not want to split a multi-file text data set. Each, you know, you'll find a variety of ways where, in this case, it was one file with a range each file being a, a range of data in the data set. Whereas in a, in a different application, it would be a different uh, test run entirely. They just put it into one big data set for uh, COS. And in that case, it's a more likely candidate easier to split it apart than it is uh, where the, all the data in the file is related to each other somehow. So some philosophical decisions that have to be made in terms of how are you going to maintain that data and stuff? And we're talking text files, because there's no uh, multi-file text file. I guess that's what goes in with this stuff, too, is multi-file text files being a coast multi-file data set. And the uh, slash EOF or tilde E markings mean nothing in Unix. The block structure is the binary block structure that is supported at the library level. Uh, sense switches, I don't think I mentioned what to do there. Uh, get op, get param. You got to figure out what they're doing with sense switches. I saw one application where they weren't doing anything with it. <laughs> Really, it, it, it was probably a leftover from some conversion that uh, was removed at the JCL level, and it was just in the code itself. Uh, there was a uh, Google plot, CalComp printer plotting package, and that one used uh, sense switches and was rewritten with getop. 
So usually they're just flags, ways of setting flags between the application and the uh, JCL level. Now when you look through the back of the uh, workbook, the Appendix B, it gives for each command, and I have to add in 117 stuff. The only stuff I saw in 117 that may not be fully supported is option, because there's a whole bunch of new things in COS 117 option statement. And all COS Unicos equivalency has really been 116 because we didn't know what was coming out with 117 in the long run. There were some things like uh, what's called job banding and other things that were worked into both systems. There are some weaknesses, and, and we can bring out some of those, I suppose, as well. Things that are going to be there but aren't in the cutoff code. And JA, in order to be compatible with charges and COS, has to know about the resource management. archiving and uh, we'll just call it TQM, SCP, that sort of stuff. In, in the uh, charges report in COAS tells you about resource consumption and gives you with RDM enabled gives you an additional set of fields and dollar log in the charges report. Also tells you about any archiving charges or usage that occurred. And tape for tape mounts, number of volumes, blocks transferred, those sorts of things. As well as SCP, number of uh, sectors transferred between the front end and the crate. None of those, stati those statistics are being kept by the system, but JA doesn't know about them. And a lot of these statistics are kept by the system, but there's no reports to look at them as well. They're just trails that are left behind that the customers are going to write a tool to analyze the statistics that are being kept. And another area would be the ASG command with CDC conversion. And another area that I'm looking into right now is, our, I'm just going to call it RDM, but it'd be UDB, actually UDB, uh, validation, error recovery stuff. Because in 117, there's a bunch of uh, administrative commands to maintain the uh, uh, catalogs and the online databases for the administrator, validate them, repair them, things like that. And I'm not sure that I've seen that in Unicos yet, or how they're going to deal with those types of issues. It was rather interesting when we got together with the COS archiving people and the Unicos archiving people, and they'd never talked, not really. And uh, they started talking about some of the problems that they were both having in error recovery and stuff like that, and, and realizing how much in common the two projects have, even though they're approaching it differently. So uh, we may encounter some other things as we go through this this week, but. There are other idiosyncrasies that I've tried to mention. Uh, one thing you might be interested in is in nameless. There's a special character, which is a dollar sign or an ampersand sign. Dollar sign is not valid in the Unix environment because that's a substitution character. So I've seen that once. Uh, we had a code that did a unformatted write to standard out, but I don't know if I can do that in COS. Uh, little things like this that you may encounter with applications as you go through them. So those are the big ones. And uh, we'll come up with some more possibly through the next week. Any questions on any of this? I think you can deal with all of them, except the tricky one is what's the programmer doing with this stuff, this, these three right here. which are all tied together. And no JCL converter, no automated program is going to be able to figure out what's going on there. It's going to take human intervention to see logically what is going on, what are we doing with this stuff, and how can we best implement it in Unicos. 
And I don't endorse your documents anymore because CDBX requires uh, a split being done. And yeah, a debug, symbol debug table for every subroutine is what you need so that you can go into them and see what's happening. We'll get into CDBX uh, later on in the week. <coughs> and I have some handouts. <coughs> okay, the next section, we're starting to get into the migration topics themselves. The next section, a lot of these sections get short now. We've been through the two big ones, the user and the feature comparison stuff. Dollar dummy lib is generated on a Unico system. In fact, the one that's hanging in distribution is a 3.0 system. And I don't think you'll find too much more different in libraries until you get to 5.0 uh, as far as entry points go. So this was created actually with a utility called put PDT, which only runs on the XMP. And these are only XMP library entry points. As I mentioned yesterday, the XMP is much better at uh, thinking of library portability or, or compatibility with COS, whereas the Cray 2 has pretty much done what they want to do, and it's been dragged along on any uh, COS compatibility issues, and usually follows by a release what the XMP group is doing. There is a plan that uh, by 7.0, things like Assign and various other areas, anything that's not architecture oriented would be brought together into one common interface, and uh, possibly even common source maintenance of the two systems libraries. But there are some key philosophical differences between the two groups and the way they do things. Uh, anybody that knows how to use segloader in uh, specifying the particular libraries, loader and segloader work with this, you're going to turn off the default libraries. That's like a no def lib. Uh, we'll see what, what it is for each uh, uh, editor, link editor. And you don't really have anything to do with dollar ABD. It's no good. It has no code in it. It just has entry points. So it used to be called a dollar mig lib, but uh, that got confused with lib mig on the uh, Unico side, which was something to satisfy the calls. So both got their names changed. Lib mig became lib cos, and this became dollar dummy lib, which is probably more descriptive of what it is anyways. Now, the rest of this chapter simply shows the input and the output. Excuse me. Sure, yeah. You said that those libraries are turned off. Does that mean that the user has to specify? Yes. That's what we're going to look at now okay. is the job. But we don't want to get those libraries, or the entry points are going to be satisfied by the default libraries. So we have to turn them off. And loader and seg loader each have a way of doing that. So you ha it's best simply to provide them with a job. So job and account, we're going to access our library. You probably you don't really want to put it in the system directory because then things might find it and there's no code in it. So that could cause problems. So you teach them to, where to access it. Access your source and make sure you get all pieces of your source. Uh, if it's got Fortran and Cal and stuff like that, you've got to know what your source is. Sometimes you'll have Fortran first and then Cal. I remember the first time that fooled me uh, with an online diagnostic, and they were all in one file rather than split apart or something. So, and hopefully the user knows if they're unsatisfied it's what those entry points are, if they're part of the application or if they're part of a support library or a site library or something like that. So in this case, I have two mo modules to it, two files, a Cal file and a CFT file, and I compile those. Suppose you might want them to turn listings off. They really don't need the listing, do they? Not for this. And then this is what you do. LDR, NX, says no execution. Otherwise, the thing coming out of this is going to try to run. No lib. That's what turns off the default libraries. And then lib equals lib, which is how I access this up here. Now, what's it going to do? 
it's going to try to link the thing. And with loader, the only message you get is in dollar log. There's no dollar out report generated. And in this case, the program is called scan. And there are two externals unsatisfied, get param and CCS, which is cracked control statement. So right away, you, your user knows that he's got two calls, both of them related. And uh, he can give somebody a call and say, this is what I've got. Your option then is to use something in libcos or rewrite it. And it can be rewritten with a get op interface. Uh, in your anthology, in fact, there is an example of a get param call being rewritten to become a get op interface, rather than using the get param call that's available in the libcos. So you don't necessarily have to live, use libcos. It's simply a fast way to use it to go on to the next problem that your conversion may uh, encounter. So the user goes to his dollar log and says, this is what we got. You, you may be able to find some way of automating this process with the uh, dollar log analysis, too, and, and looking for uh, LD009 messages or something like that. But in general, I think it's better to know the user and have him do this, because he'll know if it's a graphics library or something like that, third-party library on site. Does that make sense? Well, it, it <coughs> yeah, and that's why sites have generated this unique to themselves. Uh, but they've already got Unicos running with libraries installed. It, in a lot of cases, though, the the programmer can look at the unsatisfied externals, and he's usually not grabbing for more than you know one or two libraries, uh, support libraries to that application. And he knows what the calls are, and he can say, this is the application I'm making calls to. And you want to know about those people, too. So my question is, what happens when some of these uh, unsatisfied externals turn up in what used to be a uh, dollar I.O. life or dollar AR life? Or whatever? What if the user knows that term? Turn on? Is, this, is this little job just to show them what's missing? Show them what's missing, what they're not going to find when they go to Unicos. I'm not sure which entry points you're talking about. We do support all of AR Live and uh, things like that. Well, is by putting no live up there, you're not going to get them, are you? Not the Coast version, but you're going to get the Unicos entry point okay. version out of Dollar Dummy that's, Lib. That's and they are supported. Okay. You know, the blast routines and all that type of stuff. <coughs> FOIA transforms and s the trig functions and all that kind of stuff is in there. <coughs> The ones, if you look in Appendix C, those are the entry points that are not, yeah, C. Those are the entry points that are not supported in Unicos. <coughs> not counting Cal, we're not paying any attention to dollar Cal type entry points or V function entry points where they have a, a percent sign in the front of them. We're not counting those either. And a lot of the entry points we found are entry points within subroutines that aren't documented. There's a lot of undocumented entry points that we've found, too, that are simply entry points within a, a routine that is uh, <coughs> documented. So <coughs> what you're going to find from this is any entry point that will not be supported with standard Unicos. And standard Unicos, as we saw yesterday in the libraries area, has AR Live and it has uh, FT Lib and all of that, IO Lib and all that stuff. Now, if there's some particular cases that aren't available on COS that the site has loaded on, at least the site knows that and, and knows that this is a, they can even tabulate, oh, we got 15 people that use this one library and only 10 to the rest of them. So focus on that one first. What we're trying to do with this tool is plan ahead of time and prepare ourselves for where the time consumption is going to be. And that's why two years in advance is not a bad time to find the codes that are going to be doing a lot of stuff that uh, calling archiving routines, uh, that would be a real tough one to deal with. So it gives you an idea of what's out there. 
or at least gives your users an idea if they're going to have any work or not in porting it. Because library calls are what take the most amount of time in any application conversion. Whether it's the systems people have it worse because they usually call system library routines, archiving and uh, stuff like that. Whereas the users typically call the science libraries and those are supported. But access again will not show up in this. No depth library. In COS, it will turn off the COS default libraries that are specified in the system directory that Segloader knows about. So the only entry point tables he's going to use, the PDTs he's going to use, are all in dollar dummy lib. And each one represents an entry point in Unicos. So everything in Unicos except access. Access is one entry point that won't show up in any uh, linkage editor report because it will be satisfied. So uh, the trick is that no def lib or no lib in the loader statement says no SDR libraries that are the system coast system libraries. And inside this dollar dummy lib is the, the lib, uh, lib M for math, lib F for Fortran, uh, lib IO for the IO stuff, lib U for utilities, that sort of thing. And there was a... Uh, page in our previous chapter that listed all the library names between the two systems. Let me find that page number. What was the number? 413. And these were the counterparts. All the scilib is in libsci.a. And arlib is libm. ftlib is libf. And uh, anything that isn't supported in Unicos, I've documented in Appendix C. And it's being added to the application conversion techniques article, where we're going to then add a paragraph and examples after each call, the ones that we're definitely not going to deal with. And we have a libraries person that is going through all the libraries. He knows he supports the Coast libraries and is getting involved in this Lib Coast project. Uh, it's his, uh, it's been his uh, project, or he's been trying to control it from the beginning on what to do. And we've been fighting over whether an entry point for memory should be called memory or expand, which was one plan at one point. And he's identified all the entry points and how many we're going to deal with. And he wanted to satisfy JCL entry points as well. And other people don't, because they want the programmer to know that they're doing a workaround. If there's not a full support, if you can't do everything that is on every option, uh, you should let the programmer know rather than letting it into a production mode. So some of these things have slowed up this LibCoast project. In fact, we had a programmer hired, and then she quit the company after getting stuck between the philosophical points of view on how to deal with these uh, entry points. And I can get you a little bit later a report from that programmer on the project and the way it's uh, looking right now. So again, the same thing with segloader, except the syntax is slightly different. And a trial instead of no execution, no diff lib instead of no lib and then whatever library you're going to access. And that turns off everything but dollar dummy lib. And what's in dollar dummy lib is a PDT for each library entry point. The difference with segloader, though, is that its output is usually buried in dollar out somewhere. You can go to the dollar log and find two unsatisfied externals. That kind of thing in dollar log is generally easy to find. But anybody looking for, uh, well, we got five lines of text in a dollar out, which may have load maps around it or anything like that. Uh, if you run the job this way, turning off listings and turning off everything but this, it's pretty easy to find, as I did here. And again, it's the same program in CCS and get parameter, the two missing. Now, this particular code is on the system if you wanted to try to play with it. 
but you will not get it to actually be useful on Unicos because it's a Cal version 1 OpDef analyzer. And we don't have Cal version 1 on there. So it's analyzing a Cal version 1 output format. And you'd have to completely redesign it to, to look at a different format uh, page. So that's dollar dummy lib. Its purpose is to let coast sites put it on their system. Now, if you've got Unicos, I would probably not even put it on the system. I'd rather force them to put it, their codes onto Unicos and look on Unicos to see if it's actually uh, supported or not. You know, why give them an easy way out? Just get them to move their code, and then they can find out if there's unsatisfied. And if there aren't, they're done, possibly. So it can slow, it can uh, provide an easy way out for some users. Uh, it's, I think, more useful in a site that won't have Unicos for a while and wants to get to work on finding the codes that are going to be time consumers. 13 library calls are a lot of work. No library calls is probably a lot less work. And again, that's what slows down a migration project. Every site has reported that. Uh, Harwell's, the first site, had to deal with T-Remain. Jobs were using T-Remain to, to clean up their output and to save everything off, you know, do a final cleanup before their job terminated so they could uh, every now and then check to see how much time's left and uh, clean up if they were running out of time. And T-Remain was put on the Cray 2 because of that and hasn't made it to the X yet. And vice versa, there are things that are on the X that didn't make it to the 2 yet. Okay, so that's dollar dummy lib. If anybody wants to use it, it is available on our Coast Machine 228. Uh, anybody that wants to try it. Let's see. Okay, the next section is on the guest operating system. I'll go through this rather quickly because I know there's very little interest, but. I want to explain what's in COS 117 now and how it fits into a YMP environment, for example. The guest operating system was originally a Mendota Heights development tool. <coughs> Our developers had the same problem everyone else has. We had COS production environment running here, getting work done for the company, and our Unicos people needed to get development time. In fact, at that time, the operating system was named CXOS. And the GOS environment was called Unicos. And somebody up, up in marketing decided Unicos sounded neater and chose it as the name for all Unix-based products here. It allows COS and Unicos to run together on the same mainframe. And Unicos is a slave to COS. It runs under COS control. And COS handles a, a lot of things for Unicos. And we'll talk about those. But it allowed us to get Unicos development work to be done while running Coast production. And it's useful on some sites to get just administrative setup so that their user database is built up, their NQS configuration is done, their administrators are up to speed on the system that they have. Uh, a lot of the real trouble is just getting an analyst up to speed administrating a Unicos system when he's so used to a Coast system. Uh, it's never intended to be a production environment on both sides of the machine. You might be able to get away with it on a YMP, but in general, it was never intended to be production service for both sides of the machine. Mostly just to get administrative, get accounting hooks written, things like that, so that uh, local code that has to be retrofitted into Unicos for accounting, as a common example, could be done in advance. Most sites use GOS only for a given time frame and then go to native off hours and then squeeze out COS from there. A lot of that has been because of the previous release features, lack of dynamic capabilities. With 117, I think a site may want to run it longer than previous sites have. Uh, the kernel now is in monitor mode in Unicos. So it's not a good idea. We don't recommend any kernel mods being done. It's not designed to be stable if we're testing kernels. That should be done with a simulator environment like CSIM or something like that. In fact, we never recommend that kernel mods be made anyways. A lot of support problems that have occurred from Bell Labs to Berkeley have been, and University of Minnesota have been tracked down to local mods, 
not Unicos problems. There have been three phases to this guest operating system. The first one was a star ghost directive. And this was put up in your dead start parameter file. And during startup, it told Coast, you don't have a four meg machine, you have a two meg machine. And everything above two megs was then given to Unicos. Now the problem with this is that you'd have to go through startup again to reset that memory size configuration. And people don't like doing a dead start for something as simple as this. So that went away very quickly, but that was the quick first implementation of getting memory space and resources to the system. And that was about a 115 release. That was where it was first, uh, the code hooks were in there with 115. Many sites, though, went with 115 and backstitched phase two into it so that they could use phase two as quick as possible. And the second phase, the memory was allocated through Buffman routine in, S, in STP, and the station call processor simply thought that it was a big station buffer, segment buffer for station activity. A two megs station buffer is what he thought it was. But that was the way we pulled the system into allocating space. The advantage of this is that it's at the end of memory and more dynamic so that we can release the memory back to the system and stuff. But there were always problems in the boundary zone between the two, uh, a, a, a job coming in that would prevent, or, or a new uh, station, that's what it is, a new station logging on would, would allocate a buffer lower in memory. And when you release the Unicos buffer, that other station would have to be logged off to get all the memory back to COS. So there were little snags in that. And that was a 116 <coughs> feature, but there were sites that backstitched into their 115 release and used it at that point. So these two kind of went together. And with 116, you had either option. The advantage of the second option was that you could return the memory back to the system by just bringing down the guest operating system. Phase three then was only available with COS 117, and I don't think anybody should ever try to backstitch it. It's a major difference. And it runs with Unicos 4.0, and it will run with Unicos 5.0 and 6.0. There will be no support for GOES after 6.0. And its advantage is performance and more dynamic, both in CPU and memory. With the previous two implementations, one CPU was just totally given up to the other operating system, never returned back. With the new features, the CPUs can flip between systems at will. So phase three is the only thing I'd recommend right now, but it requires a site upgrading to 117. With 117 now, memory is operator changeable on the fly. There's a change ghost command. The operator can say, let's go from 4 meg to 2 meg. In fact, more commonly now, there's the chmem command with Unicos 5.0, and it can be backstitched into 4.0, but uh, the chmem command can be put into a cron table and at time frames of the day, fire off this chmem command to make memory size changes. And chmem will then ask COS to make its memory size change as well. And it's all automated then and occurring on the fly. Memory is given up by job rolling on either system. So whoever has to give up memory starts pushing jobs out. Uh, an interesting thing, I, in my lab, put GOES on an XMP22, two mega memory, two CPUs. And in my last class, there was not enough memory for Cal version two on the coast side with the machine split on the, down the middle. So I had to wait for my kernel make to finish on the Unico side and bring down ghost before I could finish making a command on the coast side that required Cal version two. And that's an unsegmented version. And then CFT 77, I think, was a segmented version and there was enough room for that. So I did, in my last class, have the problem of a job just suspended until memory was available. So it gets pretty tight. The smallest recommendation is an XMP24, but I think you can get away on a 12 if you don't expect too much as, as minimum. CPUs are dynamically shareable. Memory, by the way, just to highlight it, memory is always the bottleneck in a ghost environment because a, a four meg machine split in half really hurts the users or hurts somebody. That's the tight resource, memory. CPUs, CPUs are dynamically shareable. They can go between whatever system is needing the work. There's a ratio that says if uh, 
COS is not as busy as this ratio, give the CPU to COS. If COS has been 75% utilized, for example, then go to the other system. So he checks these ratios to figure out who's going to get them in a uh, both busy situation to say who, who's going to get them. And there's a fractional CPU concept, a CPU that will be flipping between two systems. Uh, if Unicos has no work to do, COS does, he'll flip back to COS. If uh, COS doesn't have anything to do and Unicos does, he'll flip back to Unicos. And the change ghost command sets up the CPU ratio. And it's always done through the idle loops. So you don't have to deal with the job rolling overhead or anything like that. The CPU's idle, so all we have to do is flip to the other system. And the environment to save off is very, very small. Disks. Disks must be configured separately. That's the second thing to consider in a ghost environment is adding disk drives. And you can split a disk drive in half. My ghost lab uses two DD29s, one for COS, one for Unicos. So uh, that's enough to do some <coughs> development work and enough to use the system to write some accounting code and stuff like that. I don't think you'd get away with any big application runs. So it depends upon what you're expecting out of one disk drive system. Tape. Tapes are the same way they work with any IBM and uh, block mux environment. You could configure them up and down, just don't have them configured up on the same drive for both systems. So you configure it up on one, down on the other, that sort of thing. And with Unicos 5.0, you can configure tape drives up and down very easily. SSD and buffer memory can be separated and can be split so that you can give half to COS, half to Unicos. And in Unicos, configure it as file system, logical device cache, and SDS, all three of them. Uh, buffer memory, generally, there isn't enough there to split apart. So <laughs> sites that do have buffer memory generally give it to one or the other, but not both. FEI links I mentioned yesterday. You do not have the capability of multiplexing over an FEI link. It's to one system or another. So you use the CHAN command on the COS side and USCP ops on Unicos 5.0 to turn the channels on and off so that that link can talk to one or the other, but not both at the same time. So that can be a problem. And NSC links are shareable. There's a logical path address in an NSC hyperchannel address. The upper hex byte is the stuff that's on the box, and the lower stuff is usually zeros. And you convert that to a two, and then you're getting logical path two through the system, and the iOS knows that that's a Unicos uh, communication. So USCP and TCP can come over that. I mentioned the support levels. The key thing is that support will end after Unicos 6.0. But this is what we've seen running at sites, the three phases that I talked about. With COS 117, and Unicos 4.0, you have a memory allocation scheme that now runs differently. It will run on an EA and YMP machines and run on 64 meg machines. So if GOS is running on a YMP, we give 16 meg to COS and four CPUs. The other four CPUs and the rest of memory go to Unicos. And Unicos can use them as he wants. Also with the YMP, we'll probably in the future be able to split the iOS lows because it'll be able to have two IOSs, but that's presently not in the system. Uh, operator controlled memory allocation I mentioned with the change ghost command and the chmem command. And also exec now addresses 64 megawords of memory to do memory error correction. That's the big thing he does. CPU scheduling is dynamic on the fly now. It's, we'll switch from the idle loop to whichever system needs the work. And if both bis systems are busy, he checks the ratio, his counters, to see if he's uh, going to go back to COS or go to Unicos. Performance improvements have occurred in 117 because Unicos now handles its own exchanges. Prior to this, every exchange out of Unicos went into the exec uh, entry point. Now that exchange only occurs when the CPU is switching from the two systems for uh, scheduling reasons or whatever servicing needs to be done. So 
A lot of the exchanges, normal exchanges, that sort of thing, are all handled in Unicos now, which are the things that you hope are being done. The ones that COS does handle for Unicos is PCI interrupts, some I.O. interrupts, and memory error interrupts. There's less packet in the exchange package manipulation between the two systems, and also the Unicos kernel now runs in monitor mode and it runs in interruptible monitor mode. So it, it can do its own XA manipulation, things like that. The one thing different with Unicos 4.0 GHOST now is that uh, the native and GHOST are separate binaries. The GHOST binary is a conditional binary. And prior to this, uh, Unicos checked a flag while it was running. Now it's determined during compilation time whether it's a ghost environment or not. So there's a little performance in, in advantage in Unicos as well. Block ghost and bind ghost are two new commands to build the system. And change ghost changes the uh, CPU and memory allocation scheme. Prior to 117, an operator had to log into Unicos to find out if it was still running or log into COS. Now there's an operator display under the DSPL command that allows you to look at ghost status. And the new Unicos command you can put down is chmem to change memory. Without that chmem hook in 4.0, this uh, dynamic memory feature is useless because you can't change Unicos. But it can be backstitched into 4.0. And also that star ghost directive I mentioned before is now gone. It's taken out of startup. So it, there's no star ghost directive anymore. Now, during the initialization process, memory will configure itself in two ways, depending upon what it sees as system memory size. If it's under 16 megawords of memory, then the Unicos processes sit here in the user job area. And the way we get this memory is by pushing jobs out on the memory segment table in COS. And the kernel is sitting right after STP. Now, if you don't have GHOS running, none of that space is, is used by Unicos. During the load GHOS uh, process, jobs are pushed out, and the kernel and processes are put into that memory space. And we think it's a big COS job. <coughs> then the this boundary would be operator controlled by CHMEM and done by job rolling. Now, if the system is a YMP or an EA machine, it'll, it, if it has more than 16 megawords of memory, then during the initialization process, we'll load the kernel down after STP and declare everything above 6 megawords as Unicos process space, where all the Unicos jobs will run. So we can use all of that memory there. The kernel still has to be down here so that he can talk to exec better and because of the uh, addressing capabilities that he needs. He, he is actually bound into exec. And that bind ghost command resolves externals between COS and Unicos, because they have to address into each other. And it, it was originally 01 systems that said, what about GHOS on the Y? But uh, they don't need it now. They've got another machine. Huh? Yeah. But uh, you're still going to put ghosts on the Y? Oh, OK. Because you were the first ones to bring it up, and I brought it to a migration meeting, and they said, fine. The next couple of pages, I'm not going to go through. They're just internal stuff. Go to page uh, 624. Just to tell you how the process is built. Based question. Uh huh. So is when Ghost is running, it really is Coast and Unix is running, or Unicos is running as a subsystem under Coast. Right. Now I've always been asked when is Unicos going to have a Ghost environment for Unicos? There is that feature in 5.0 now. It's called slash VM for a virtual machine environment so that you can do a pre-production test of your operating system 
while you're still running production services to your normal service people, to your normal users. And it's called slash VM. And uh, it's a 5.0 feature, and I certainly haven't seen it work or know very little about it, but that's what it's there for, is to allow you to do pre-production test runs without impacting your users. Was there any other questions? Now, with the GOES uh, environment, it's the Unicos kernel that has to be specially built to run GOES. It used to be a flag that was checked at runtime by the Unicos kernel. Now he no longer has to take the time to do those checks. The compilation process takes different paths in the logic to handle specifically I.O. and some other things. Now this is just a flow chart. What you're going to do is use your make command to make your kernel. And it's going to leave, we're going to see what change you do, but it's going to leave a kernel relocatable that hasn't been run through segloader yet. And it leaves the segloader directives. If you don't have this native, if you have this native macro in there, then it's going to generate a kernel that is standalone, what we call a native Unicos binary. Now, by default, that is set within the make file, and I'll show you that on the next page. So you go into your make file, change that, and then do a make, and it leaves you with the kernel and the segloader directives. You then transfer them across. This example uses it through the uh, 80 megabyte disk pack. But I find that very short on space usually. And I would prefer doing it through the front end. I do it through the front end here because I've got more space in my front end than I have on that 80 megabyte pack. And I hate removing things off that pack to get this transfer done. So I do it through the station. But they show EXDF to dispose it off to the expander pack and then a fetch to bring it in. And both of these are going to be in a Unix unblocked format. So you have to make sure they either get blocked. When you fetch this in, you say it's a character blocked, it will block it. And then you don't need to block, use block ghosts. And the other way, the kernel coming in is going to be transparent. And then you block that with the block ghost command. You then run these through bind ghosts. And bind ghosts is going to basically call segloader with an address of check coast system to see where he's going to actually load this, this binary at, this ghost binary. So he's going to check the active running system for a load address, use the segloader directives and a couple of directives of his own, and call segloader and link the thing together and bind it to the addresses that he knows about in exec. And then the load ghost command is what actually starts the thing up. And you have a dead start parameter file specified on the load ghost command. You're going to lose a iOS station console to, to use as a Unicos console. And it has to be station 0. So when you operators bring up the system, they'd want to use station 1 rather than station 0. Because Unicos is hard coded to use channels 40 and 41, station 0, for its kernel console. So the load goes command is then what makes the memory allocation and CPU allocation and all that sort of stuff. The next page is what the make file looks like. And all you have to do is go down to this one line here, delete that hyphen D native, get out of the file, and then do another make. And you've got a Unicos binary. The recommendation with 117 is that you install the Unicos system in native mode, build your configurations and everything in native mode, and then generate your ghost binary. And, it, and it's already installed. But there is one site that's going to install it uh, with a ghost binary that I'm providing him, basically. So I'm going to send him his ghost binary, and he's going to do the install process from the binary I send him. The DSPL command is what shows up on the next page, 628, and shows you the operating system name. The thing you look for is Unicos panic messages and whether ghost is running or not. This machine set up for a CPU percentage of 75% guaranteed to COS. Now, that's not an exact number, but right around 75%. And it also gives the addresses of where things are loaded at. There are a variety of other commands available with the stat ghost to look at the status. It's basically a pre 
DSPL command. Dump ghost allows you to dump the uh, ghost area and you can move that uh, dump to the Unico side and use crash on it or you can use F dump on the coast side. So ghost dumps, uh, Unicos, w the Unicos crash command will be able to look at them. Load ghost is what actually loads the binary, allocates the memory and starts the Unicos system. And then change ghost, this is where you specify your percentage for CPU utilization or memory size. Now these commands have two ways of doing it. Last word address is easier for a YMPEA machine and size is easier for less than 16 megs. So that's why you have it two different ways. Depending upon the type of machine, it's easier to know oh, the way you want to specify it. It's easier to say last word address is 64 meg than it is to figure out how much memory that is. And that's it for ghosts. There is a ghost handout that I gave you uh, from a Cug page.